We must now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Questions 1 and 9 have been withdrawn. And I call Mr Adrian Cochrane Watson. Mr Adrian Cochrane Watson. A well-regulated industry is vital in underpinning trade, and increasingly it is a strength the uh, agri-food industry is exploiting and securing new export markets. Following a joint DARD and DOE review of better regulation in 2009-10, DARD implemented an action plan taking forward 61 recommendations to reduce the administrative burden on the agri-food sector. By 2013, a 10.4% reduction had been achieved. Since 2013, we have continued to make good progress. Most notable is the recent achievement of official brucellosis free status, allowing relaxation of controls leading to savings in compliance costs for the primary production sector of 7 million per annum, as well as 8 million in savings for the taxpayer. Another area where we have progressed in, its com in completion of land eligibility inspections by remote sensing using satellite imagery rather than by on farm inspections. In 2015, DARD completed 86% of basic payment schemes inspections using remote sensing. Despite my desire for, for a simpler cap regime, the new regimes are greater in number and more complex to administer. However, my officials are working to ensure that they are as easy as possible to understand, with information and tools available to help farmers and others comply with the least amount of bureaucracy attached as possible. I have also made a separate approach to Commissioner Hogan in Brussels in an attempt to make the penalty regime applied in cases of over declaration of some um, schemes as simple as possible. I am pleased there has been some movement in this with the latest announcements from the Commissioner. I want to continue to focus on ensuring that complying with the rules and accessing services is further simplified. The continued rollout of enhanced digital services with appropriate support will speed up processing and help customers uh, businesses to succeed in the future. Mr. Cochrane Watson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Minister for the response. However, Minister, I think many farmers will be sorely disappointed that there has been an abject failure within the Department to adjust its own administration costs. Indeed, previous targets, such as those contained in the 07 2011 programme for government, have now been abandoned. And can the, does the Minister feel it's acceptable that the total DARD administration bill? is now over £45 million centrally in this financial year as supplied by DFP in compared to a reduction of £5 million five years ago. Well, I note that um, your own party has um, particularly taken this issue up and run with it in the media and used figures which they have manipulated for their own benefit to try and have a headline out of it. But I will, I'm very happy to explain to the member the difference in, in the figures that we're talking about. And if you're asking me, am I apologetic for putting more resources into services that helps us deliver farmers' um, payments, then I'm not apologetic for that. Well, Mr. Declan McGillan. Uh, uh, um, I, I note and welcome the Minister's and her Minister's response. She expressed a desire for less bureaucracy and more simplification. So in that context, would the Minister um, would the Minister consider making provision for part payments? I think we all can recognise that it's been an extremely um, difficult year for, the, for, for all sectors right across the farming um, industry. And I think that anything that I can do, I've always said that whilst a lot of these things are commercial matters and outside of my department's control, some things are within my control. And one of those things has been in relation to make sure that we paid the maximum number of people and year on year we've seen improvements in, in the number of people that we've been able to pay in December. That being said, and, and I, I want to actually put on record, uh, firstly, my credit to all the staff that have actually um, outperformed all other paying agencies on these islands when you compare us to um, other areas. We have outperformed in terms of ensuring that we paid 96 per cent of people at this stage. So I think that all credit um, to, to those staff that have been involved in delivering that work. I have also indicated, as, as the member um, referred to, part payments is an issue which the industry have um, consistently asked me to take a look at. And my focus initially was around making sure we maximise the payments, that we increase the number of people that were inspected with remote control sensing. And now that we have been able to do that, what I have asked officials to do is to, um, or I have told them that my intention is to make sure that we can get to a position where we will make part payments up to 50 per cent of direct payments, um, which will be made on the 16th of October following submission of the single application form. That option, as I said, hasn't been available until now, but I think this is good news for the industry in going forward that we will be able to um, make, come to the scenario where we're able to make advanced payments um, to about 80 per cent of eligible farmers uh, in October. That being said, us being able to deliver on that promise will be very much down to working with the industry themselves. I need more farmers to apply online. 
The application process for this year will be um, coming up very shortly. And what I'm, my, my clear message to the industry is help me to help you. The more um, applications that we receive um, online, uh, and ideally, what we'd want to have is over 70% of applications online. Obviously, last year there was significant improvement, and I think the figure was over 40%. If we could increase that again this year, then we'd be in a position where we're able to, the department will be able to deliver in terms of making those part payments in October. Mr. Declan McAleer. Being too generous, I call Mr. Jim Allister. If the minister's blind enthusiasm for the EU would permit her. Would she undertake to publish a schedule of all the administrative burdens and regulations placed upon the farming community and identify which originate from the EU and which originate from her department? Would she undertake to do that, or would that come too close to exposing the hideous burden that the EU puts upon our farmers? That's not even a problem. I don't have a problem except now very clearly what legislation we work under within the EU. But I also don't have a problem with publishing the benefits that our industry receives from the EU, particularly in terms of single farm payments, the rural development programme, the peace programmes, the list goes on. So I'm very happy to publish all that information because it's important that you take a look at the situation in the round. There are diktats from Europe which we find very difficult to administer, which we find very difficult for the farm industry in, in particular. Are there room for improvement? Absolutely. But that's our job to do that. We're elected to do that. That job. Also, our MEPs are elected to do that job. So we have a job of work to do in terms of reform in the EU. But let's take on that challenge and let's not rob our rural industry and our agri-food sector of much-needed support. If you look at the most recent um, statistics in relation to farm incomes, without that subsidy, without that support, farmers would have been in a negative situation. Not one penny of profit. There actually would have been a negative loss-making scenario. So. I think that whenever we look at um, the future within Europe, we need to look at it in the round and we need to look at the benefits that are there for the local industry. Troy Beggs. The, the Minister was unapologetic about increased administrative costs. With a reducing budget and efficiency savings, which we're hearing about it, one would have expected administrative burden to have gone down. Does she, uh, does she accept that farmers expect to get a higher percentage of the funding rather than it being absorbed on administrative burdens? Well, farmers and, and the rural community at large can be very confident and, and know that I have delivered the largest ever rural development programme that's ever been seen for the North. So I think that in itself speaks volumes in terms of my commitment and how I deliver for farmers and for rural dwellers. In relation to the admin costs, I'm very happy to provide a breakdown um, on, in relation to, to the figures that have been set out and you, that your own party are referring to around the £5 million. It's not as simple as um, just subtracting as, as your party have done, but I'm very happy to explain the difference in terms of the, the baseline figures and the figures that were compared to. I'm absolutely going to provide that to you in writing instead of moving through the stats now, but I can, I can give you um, headlines in relation to £2.5 million in relation to depreciation in terms of land and property service valuation. So this, it's very simply explained, but I um, stand over my point that I am not apologetic to put more admin resources to making sure that we delivered the maximum number of people being paid their single farm payment in December, which we have delivered on, and now 96 per cent are paid as a result of me refocusing and making sure that I had enough people on the front line to be able to deliver that money. Mr Trevor Lund for a question. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Uh, firstly, let me say that a referendum in favour of Brexit will be disastrous for agriculture and rural development in the north because it would hinder access to vital EU markets and lead to reduced agricultural support. And that's a point that I've made consistently <coughs> in this House. In terms of contingency planning, a withdrawal from the EU would take effect following the conclusion of if there was a Brexit um, scenario, or, and it would take up to two years following that for notification would be, would be submitted to the EU, and it would take up to two years for a withdrawal to be complete. And actually that um, number of years can be extended, I'm also told. So the period between the decision to withdraw and the withdrawal actually taking effect would be used to negotiate um, the terms of a withdrawal within, from the EU. It would also be used by the Assembly to negotiate with the British Government on what contingency plans might be developed to replace existing EU rules and financial support systems following EU withdrawal. Over the 2014-20 EU budget period, Pillar 1 payments for our farmers would amount to £2.3 billion. In addition, £228 million of EU funds are devoted to a rural development programme, resulting in a total planned expenditure under cap of £2.53 billion. Importantly, the Assembly could not maintain this level of funding unless additional funds were provided from the Treasury. 
The British Government has consistently pushed for reductions in support going to farmers and for rural development under the cap. They did not regard that spending as value for money, so I believe the Treasury would be unsympathetic to our calls for some of the money saved from withdrawn as a, um, from the Member State um, from the EU to be used to maintain to support farmers and rural communities. A significant reduction in direct support would leave many of our farmers in real and um, long-term financial difficulty. A reduction of funding for farmers and rural communities would have knock-on effects for the environment. Mr. Lund, for supplement. I uh, to thank the Minister for that answer. She has more or less answered my, any supplementary I might have come up with, frankly. But uh, would she agree with me that, uh, for the benefit perhaps of others that are present, that this would be an absolute disaster for Northern Ireland, here, here. and that uh, here, the British here. government would the, Brit the British government would neither have the will nor the ability here, here. to replace these payments like for like. Yes, I mean I, I totally agree with that. As I said, 2.53 billion is what we're talking about here in relation to supports for agri-food sector and for rural communities. That's not something that there's um, any intention of a current Tory, gov a Tory government in replacing. We have seen the cuts to our block grant year on year, and if that's the, 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 pro the projections for the future, I, don't, I wouldn't hold out much hope in terms of the Tories who have an ideological position opposed to subsidy, who have a position where they have been trying to reduce year on year. They voted against the financial package in Europe, so they voted to reduce the payments that actually go into the agri-farming and, and rural sectors. So I wouldn't be confident and what they would um, bring in place. I've consistently said this, and the biggest concern I think that the industry have is there's so many uncertainties. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what a post-Brexit situation looks like. And without all those certainties, it's very hard for anybody to make a rational choice in terms of going forward. However, I think 2.53 billion is significant and speaks volumes in terms of um, what it means to our local economy, what it means to the agri-food sector, and what it means to everybody. Because if farmers aren't subsidised to produce food, all consumers will be paying more for food, which we'll have to import from other countries around the world. And where do we get that from if we can't trade openly and freely within Europe. So there's a number of significant challenges that we need to seriously consider in terms of um, where we are at and how we're going to be in the future in relation to the Brexit situation. Mr Gregory Camp. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, would the Minister uh, not agree that to talk in terms of nightmare situations uh, in, in the context of a Brexit position doesn't help the discussion, which should be a rational discussion, on whether the UK and Northern Ireland as a part of the UK stays in Europe or leaves it, and that the uncertainty that you rightly talked about equally exists whether we stay in Europe or whether we leave in terms of the financial assistance that may be on offer to our farming communities. Well, I think I've made my position clear. I do think that we need to have a rational discussion. I do think we need to up the ante in terms of having the debate. I think every question time for the past no, sort of two or three times we've had this discussion, but we need a real and meaningful debate around what our future is. But that speaks volumes, 2.53 billion in terms of investment in our local economy. Agri-food is the mainstay in terms of our local economy. It's one of the main drivers in terms of growth. And if you look at the income that farmers received, the stats that were published this week around farm incomes towards the end of last week, it clearly pointed to the fact that without that subsidy, without that payment going to farmers and rural people, they would have been in a negative, negative situation. So we need to be serious about what this means. I think we all can agree that Europe needs to be reformed. Absolutely. We can all stand, I think, and say there's room for improvement, some of the regulations, the red tape, everything that goes with it. But that's what we're elected to do that job. It's our job to challenge and make sure that we challenge where things aren't right and where things can be made better. I was able to successfully challenge in relation to cap reform for some simplification around greening. So there are examples where we can point to where we have been able to make a difference. I, I am elected to do a job. I am a Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. I will challenge and fight my corner for this local industry in Europe, and I think that's, that's what I should be doing. That's the job I could concern myself with. But I am genuinely, absolutely, 100 per cent concerned, as is the industry, as is the business community, concerned about what a post-Brexit situation means for them. And if we take it purely in terms of um, the agri-food sector and the rural economy, it's a significant blow to that economy if we were to withdraw from Europe. Ms. Rosie McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And can I ask the Minister what is the current level of trade between the North and other EU regions? Yes, the latest available figures indicate that 73 per cent, and again this points to the significance of um, trading within Europe, the latest figures indicate that 73 per cent of our agri-food and drinks processing sector were to destinations outside of the North of Ireland. 
In terms of exports from the north, 60% of all exports of all goods and 90% of all food and drink exports go to other EU countries. Therefore, it is no exaggeration, I believe, to say that the EU markets are critical, critically important in terms of the North's agri-food industry. As well as the trade and processed food products, there are also high levels of live, live animal and raw milk trade across the border with, in, with the South. With tw in 2015 alone, almost 28,000 live cattle came north, while 332,000 sheep and around 20% of milk produced in the North went South. So when you look at those, even just as, you know, very quickly, um, Sort of put together stats that shows how important it is within, uh, in terms of trade implications, that there will be a post-Brexit situation. Our level of trade within the EU is so significant to our local industry. So that's the, the, the factors, I suppose, that we need to be taken into consideration when it comes to deciding on what our future is. Speaking of McLaughlin, for question number four. A strategic outline case to support the work of Forest Service to commercialise its wind um, potential has already been approved, and I am pleased to report that the next stages of business case uh, work will be presented to me shortly for consideration. This will inform how best to commercialise the potential that exists on the forestry estate. There have been significant policy changes in the renewables area throughout 2015, both locally and in Westminster, which has led to inevitable delays as Forest Service considers how best to integrate these changes into their proposals. The proposals coming forward now have taken these changes into consideration. Clearly, revenues from my department, or indeed communities, will be dependent on sites becoming operational. And I'm sure you would all welcome, as I do, the opportunity to generate revenue from public assets, particularly given the current budgetary situation that which we find ourselves in. Before taking a supplementary, could I appeal to members please to check your mobile phones as there's significant feedback, and that, of course, affects the recording equipment. Ms. Mia McLaughlin for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can I ask maybe specifically in light of, of policy changes, maybe how the Department now intends to manage the environmental impacts of wind farm developments going forward? Yes. Um, obviously, wind farm development is subject to robust plan assessment, either by the councils or DOE, depending on the scale of the development. <laughs> And planning consideration is against robust planning policies, and each proposal on the forest estate will be subject to a full environmental impact assessment. As with any planning application, interested parties have the opportunity to raise concerns or objections. Wind energy development on the forest estate is likely to involve um, some felling of trees in the immediate environment of turbines to accommodate installation of wind farm infrastructure. Any of our proposals will be assessed against environmental standards and the planning standards that already exist for wind farms. In assessing the forest estate for wind energy potential, my department has shown leadership and, as part of its process, forest services excluded um, uh, environmentally designated areas like special protection areas known as SPAs. Mr Jerry Kelly for a question. Uh, question for I welcome the, welcome the progress to date of the All Island Animal Health and Welfare Strategy, which has the wide support of industry on the island and is an excellent example of what can be achieved if we take a joined-up approach. It provides a valuable forum, enabling discussion and practical cooperation on a wide range of animal health and welfare issues. Positive outcomes include cooperation on contingency planning for exotic disease outbreaks, agreement on a common chapter in the respective epizootic contingency plans for foot and mouth disease, avian influenza, African horse sickness and blue tongue, cooperation on testing regimes for TB and brucellosis in border areas, Cooperation in relation to the exchange of data to facilitate trade in bovine animals, including the lifting of the BSE export ban. A development of a largely similar system of sheep identification. Introduction of a BVD programme, which will require herd keepers to tag and test all newborn calves for BVD in the north. This will put herd keepers on an equal footing with those in the south, where a BVD eradication programme is already in place. Officially, brucellosis um, free status was approved by the EU, EU Commission, and this means that OBF status has been achieved in both jurisdictions, attain an OBF status that has allowed me now to further relax our testing regime here in the north. All of these examples demonstrate that there are considerable benefits resulting from the strategy in terms of animal health and welfare on the whole of the island, and these can help to protect us from disease outbreaks that may have serious consequences for trade and for public health. There is an ongoing and active work programme in place supported by close cooperation from officials to help ensure the delivery of the strategy. I thank the Minister for her answer up to now. It was a very comprehensive one. Maybe she would elaborate on the ultimate aim of uh, the strategy which she just outlined. 
the ultimate aim of the um, strategy is the development of policies which will facilitate that free movement of animals across this island. In implementing the strategy, both administrations are guided by a number of key principles, including achieving or maintaining consistently high standards of animal health and welfare, improve public health and effective um, capacity to deal with emergencies within a policy framework. To work towards this aim, three key strategic areas have been identified. Partnership, further cooperation on trade, animal identification and movement policies, and further cooperation on developing disease control and animal welfare policies. Mr. William Mervyn. And the Minister uh, talks about uh, an all Ireland health strategy on animal health. Um, does the Minister accept that uh, the Irish Republic has reduced TB to a much more level, lower level than Northern Ireland and has done that through uh, a badger cull and also a deer cull? Has the Minister and her officials looked at how the Irish Republic has been able to reduce TB levels and is she, will she tell the House whether or not she will take the same action? The the levels in the south are different to our levels, and I think that they're, they're not even consistent across the board. So, depending on what area you're looking at, there's higher levels and, and lower levels. So, I think that um, the member um, knows that there's no simple solution to TB. There's no quick fix because if there was, I would have done that long before now. Um, when you look towards um, right across Europe, when you look towards um, all of our neighbours, nobody has the, the you know the the, the the solution, the simple solution to this. But what we are doing is working our way through a number of um, areas at work and you'll be very aware of the work of the TB Strategic Partnership Group which is looking at TB in the round, it's looking at all the contributory factors, it's looking at the wildlife issue, it's looking at the issue of compensation, so it's looking at all of those factors and then they will report to me, you'll know that they've reported on an interim basis but they will report to me very shortly over the next number of months in relation to a firm strategic approach and going forward. We all share the same aim of wanting to eradicate this disease. We've been very successful in relation to brucellosis, but I hope to get to the, the stage where we are also successful on, in relation to TB. And I believe the strategic approach that we, which we are now adopting as a result of the work of the partnership will be very key to us being able to deliver on that. This is Karen McEvitt. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, given the success of this strategy, and you did uh, describe it uh, using a joint uh, uh, approach and what can be achieved when uh, success uh, is a fine example uh, in your previous um, answer, can you outline, Minister, what discussions uh, are underway to merge other areas of agricultural policy uh, on an all-island basis? Well, we have the North South Ministerial Council, and which recently met, and we look at a number of key areas where we can cooperate. Animal health and, and plant health is obviously key areas going forward. We also look at um, the implications for trade, our engagement with Europe. We look at marketing, and one of the, the new bodies which has been established under the Going for Growth strategy is the new marketing body, which is going to have very close links with um, Board BA in terms of um, let's work together to um, get into new markets around. Um, what we have to offer, which is um, the same from whether it's a, a, a calf born in, in Tyrone or, or Cork. It's this good, high quality product which we can market across the world and we can do that together. So there's quite a number of areas that are ongoing, particularly plant health at the minute in relation to some of the challenges we have around plant disease. Um, but, but quite a broad range of work and I want to continue um, to, to work with um, the, the department in, in the 26 counties around where else, and I'm continually looking towards where else we can um, find new areas of cooperation, but I think it's fair to say that we have very strong links and work, particularly in relation to research, there's really good opportunities with AFBI and Chuswick in the 26 counties and we're certainly exploring all of those uh, potential areas as we speak. Mr. Chris Little. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister for an update on the review of the Welfare of Animals Act? Not really relevant to this question, but um, yes, I can give you an update. You'll be aware that I've written and corresponded with Minister Ford around the sentencing issue. He has agreed to take that forward, so we're progressing some of the, the, the main key asks in relation to the review that, that we had. Um, there was a number of recommendations put forward, and I think that we can deliver on all of those recommendations. It's important that we send a very strong message um, in relation to that we will not tolerate animal cruelty, that we have some of the strongest legislation on these islands, and that there is proper deterrence in place, which I believe the initiative which myself and Minister Ford have taken will, will lead to that situation. Mr Gordon Dunn for a question. Deputy Speaker. The European Commission has approved our proposals for a rural development programme worth up to £623 million. This is an increase, an increase in funding in almost 16 per cent compared with the current programme and gives us the largest RDP that we have ever had. We are rolling the programme out in a staged and coordinated way. Two months ago, I launched several major programmes within the RDP, 
The first phase of the Foreign Business Improvement Scheme opened in November last year with the Business Development Group um, Scheme. Over 3,000 applications were received and the Foreign Business Improvement Scheme will be a package of measures aimed at knowledge transfer, cooperation, innovation and capital investment, which will help support sustainable growth in the sector. The first phase focused on knowledge transfer with the funding allocation of £28 million is intended to help farmers clearly identify their needs ahead of any capital investment and to make informed decisions about developing their business. The LEADER programme, which includes £70 million of funding to support our rural communities, is also underway. Opening for applications under LEADER is a two-stage process. The first stage of opening for applications is for LAGs to hold funding workshops, and these events have already started and will increase over the next month. Up to £17.4 million has been allocated for forestry grant schemes that I also launched in uh, November last. I shall also be making £10 million available for a rural tourism scheme, and a business case for the scheme is underway, and we are working to ensure that we will open our first call for applications in March or April. And we are continuing to develop the business case for further schemes, including the capital investment schemes, the environmental farming scheme, and I hope to announce the timetable for opening of further RDP schemes before the conclusion of the current mandate. Mr. Dunn for Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers and the information she's given today. Does the Minister recognise the need for prompt action in relation to the programme, as farmers who are desperate to, to gain financial support see this as an opportunity to diversify and, in many ways, develop their supporting business? Yes, as I said in the conclusion of, of my answer, I intend to have, um, I've already launched quite a wave of, of um, funding opportunities for the wider agri-food and rural sector, particularly in relation to the grants that I've launched. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme, the first phase is underway, and I hope to be in the position over the next um, short while to be able to launch the actual scheme itself. I know it's something that farmers are very keenly waiting for the outcome of it or waiting for it to be launched. That's not the only scheme. It's very important that we also get the leader scheme opened up, and I hope to be able to um, support um, the local ags in terms of them opening up for calls for, uh, for applications and to be live over the next number of weeks. Um, I think certainly by, by mid-March we would like to be in a position where all those applications have, all those lags have opened up for calls. So quite a large um, number of schemes that have been opened. It is the most significant and largest rural development programme we've ever achieved. My priority now is making sure that we get that spend on the ground as quickly as possible. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister what account has she made for increasing the avail availability of uh, shared space within the Rural Development Programme? There will be applications um, or there will be opportunities even under the Rural Development Programme through the leader approach, so looking at basic services, shared services, how those applications are very much a grassroots, bottom up approach. It's not something that the Department tells. Um, the, uh, tells individual communities how, what they would need. It's the beauty of the Rural Development Programme is in fact that um, very much it's a community that identifies a project or a, something that they want to take forward and then they apply into the programme. So there certainly would be lots of opportunities o over all the measures that are there within the programme to actually for, for pro projects to come forward that have a shared space nature. Well, Mr Phil Flanagan for a question. Yeah, a short question number seven. The Young Farmers Payment is providing young farmers um, with a valuable incentive to take full responsibility for a farm business. In 2015, the number of applications received demonstrates the commitment of this sector to the regeneration and development of the local industry. The Young Farmers Payment attracted 2,086 applications, and I can confirm that 1,776 applications have been processed and decisions have been issued. Over 80 per cent of these applications have been successful. Applicants who have not been successful can seek a review of decision or make a fresh application this year. Approximately 500 young farmers are currently undertaking the Level 2 qualification with CAFRI, which so shows that there's still a significant interest for uh, the Young Farmers Scheme going forward into next year, even for those people that weren't successful in getting in this year. Flanagan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can she uh, elaborate further on the, the comment she's made about the, the, the review that's open to um, appealants and, and when that will conclude? And she could also provide an update on the processing of outstanding applications with regards to the discrepancies around active farmers? Yeah, in relation to reviews, the farmers or young farmers have an, an opportunity to um, go through, which is a two-stage um, appeal. They all take different lengths of time. I couldn't um, give a definitive length of time, but um, suffice to say, we know it's how important it is, and if they're um, their, their payments be processed in, in as speedy a manner as possible. In relation to the active farmer issue, letters were issued to just over 3,000 businesses given a deadline of um, August, 3rd of August last year to produce evidence that this is supposed to clarify that they were in fact active farmers. 
249 businesses who did not respond to the active farmer letter were subsequently rejected for not providing any type of evidence of activity. Administrative and te technical assessments of the responses are still ongoing. All businesses who have received a request for additional evidence must submit that by the 29th of January. So we've had a significant number of people that have done that by um, last week, and we hope to have those all turned around and payments made by March. Order time is up. We now move on to topical questions. Mr. Edwin Poots is not in his place. I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Um, can the Minister outline what difference her rural proofing bill will make to our rural communities? Yes, absolutely. And I'm so delighted that um, we're going to be able to get to the stage where hopefully we have the final stage before the end of this mandate. Um, it's been a, a significant bill in that it aims to promote a fair and inclusive rural society by ensuring that the consideration of rural needs are embedded within government policy making and also in service delivery. The member will know that the legislation places a duty on public authorities to, be, um, to take into account the, the rural needs when developing, adopting or implementing or revising policies, strategies and plans and designing and delivering public services. So whilst I think all departments have signed up to rural proofing since 2002, I think the bill goes at that stage further and makes sure that it compels all departments to give due consideration to um, policy or strategic changes that will have an impact in relation to the lives of rural areas. Because I think that um, in terms of going forward, we want to make sure that, is, that rural people can be assured that this executive, that um, our departments um, will prioritise and make sure they do take proper account of the needs of rural dwellers. And this legislation for, for me has been a priority in relation to safeguarding the rights of rural communities. Mr. Ram for supplement. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer and I wonder would she outline um, when does she expect the bill will have completed the legislative process in the Assembly? Yes, I've, um, we have had some considerable um, some considered amendments being put forward by the ARD committee which further reaffirm I think the broad principles of the bill and I'm currently seeking the executive support to include them in the legislation. So when consideration with consideration stage and further consideration stage being proposed for February, I expect that the bill will complete its passage in the Assembly by the start of March. So that's something that certainly I'm looking forward to being able to uh, say that we uh, have delivered in terms of protecting the rights of rural dwellers. Question three was withdrawn. I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, um, Whilst I see that the Minister has loads of notes and post-its, um, maybe she'll have an answer to this, but it's constituency-based nonetheless. But, you know, the Minister obviously announced the um, awarding of the um, Rivers Agency headquarters um, at Lockery to QMAC Construction back in July. Can the Minister give us an update on where things are with that? Yep. Um, delighted that the project is um, going full steam ahead. The old premises were demolished, the, the built and work is starting. It's going to be an opportunity for, um, it will deliver 80 public sector jobs into the Mid Ulster area. Um, it's part of my wider project around um, obviously decentralising a government department um, and it's the whole of the department with um, the headquarters going to Ballykelly, Forest Service going into Fermanagh, um, Fisheries going into Down and um, River Station headquarters going into Lockery. So I um, was delighted that um, as a result of the tender process that a local company also achieved the, the work, so it creates local employment. So it's the ongoing benefits that brings, it's an increased footfall into the Cookstown area. So all, all those benefits I think are brilliant and it gives more people an opportunity to access a public sector job because we're taking a whole department out of Belfast. Well, Mr McRae for supplementary. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister therefore content that um, everything is going according to schedule and that there won't be any slippages? But on, in, in respect of a conversation that I had with her regarding gas to the west, have the um, department or indeed the, the construction company have any contact with the um, either Daddy or the, the uh, people involved with the Gas to the West project to ensure that um, the heating system um, is up to standard for whenever gas passes that way? Um, all those things are taken into consideration whenever you're, you're designing a new build. Um, I, I would confirm for you in writing just in relation to that, but I'm quite sure that, that has been a factor. Um, obviously, Gas to the West is something that not just would benefit River Station headquarters, but all those businesses in that area who are, who are struggling. So the, the sooner we can get it, the better, but it's a number of years down the line. 
and um, but but certainly that in any new build you'd what you'd build in the flexibility that you're able to adjust if we if we did or when we get to the, the situation where we will have gas in the west. Barry Michael Duff for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if we're any closer to developing an all island label and I'm speaking here in respect of food produce and meat essentially? Yes, um, I suppose just to, to, to set out clearly that farmers across um, this island produce a product where the quality and the traceability and the high standards are recognised worldwide. I think that's why whenever we go out to, to seek new markets, we can always um, stand over that, that very high quality. The issue of, and the member will remember, the issue of nomadic cattle, which, was, uh, which pointed out in the first instance the issue around labelling. It's one that I've been focused on resolving since the, since the EU um, country of origin labelling began to take effect on this island, which basically made, had a major implication for all island trade of cattle due to the penalties being imposed on beef processors in the north. Since then, the regulations have been extended to other produce, including lamb and pork and poultry. And this is having a specific impact on the north-south trade in lamb. I've personally met with the marts, with the processors, with farmers who've been impacted, as well as making representations to Minister Truss in Defra and London, Minister Coveney in Dublin and Commissioner Hogan in Brussels. Both Minister Truss and Commissioner Hogan have recognised the impact which these regulations are having on the island of Ireland due to the anomaly of partition and have offered their support in us securing a resolution with our colleagues in the South by way of an Island of Ireland food label. Mr. For thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. And can I ask the Minister how she would characterise Minister Coveney's attitude to this debate and might the North-South Ministerial Council provide further opportunities in the future to pursue this matter? Yes, I think that um, it's been disappointing to say the least that we haven't been able to get to a situation where we can resolve this <laughs> issue um, more speedily. It certainly hasn't been from the want of trying on my behalf. I think the fact that we have DEFRA on board, that we have um, the European Commissioner on board, it's unfortunate that um, Minister Coveney hasn't got on board and, show, and shown um, leadership with me around um, assisting the industry to be able to deliver on an all-island label. The, the label which is, I referred to in the initial answer around the island of Ireland food label would solve the issue for um, both the beef sector but any other sectors that are impacted as a result of country of origin labelling. So I hope that um, Minister Coveney will um, join with me in showing that leadership will join with me in trying to resolve an issue which has impact um, right across all sectors and will impact across all sectors. We have a traditional um, trade pattern on this island, um, whether it be beef, poultry, um, pork, dairy, all sectors have a traditional trade pattern, something that's been going on for, for um, a considerable period of time. It's important that we remove any barriers there are to trade, for um, whether that be north-south or, or south-north. So I hope that um, Minister Coveney will join me in accepting an invitation which we have received recently from the South's key farming representatives, the marts, the processors and the farmers. And that will be an opportunity for us to jointly show leadership and to jointly um, press for the, for the need for the issue to be resolved. I believe there's a solution to it. It's just about um, having all ministers involved in terms of taking it forward. Mr. Martin Muller for a topical question. Uh, I'm going to ask John Corley. I wanted to ask the Minister about TTIP, about the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. Minister, and perhaps you could spell out the implications of TTIP to the agricultural industry right across the island. Yeah, I, I have um, always said that I have grave concerns in relation to um, how these negotiations have been advanced. They've been taken forward in a secret nature, which runs contrary to um, democratic transparency, but more importantly, the potential threats to agriculture here from um, across Europe, or, or to here and across Europe. I think that the net impact of TTIP is likely to be in favour of US farmers, especially in beef, if tariffs are fully removed, and there are significant reductions in non-tariff barriers. There are also anticipated risks for the pork and poultry sectors, and further to this, TTIP has the potential to lower production standards, and I know that some agricultural organisations have consulted with their members on issues such as the use of chemical rinses and sprays in the decontamination of meat, which are currently banned within the EU. I think this highlights the growing pressure that farmers feel to decimate their standards. Farmers fear that they're going to be backed into a corner, to either degrade their product now or, be in risk, or risk being frozen out of the market later. So therefore, I have to question what are the potential impact that this trade deal could have on food safety and the EU's, farm, um, the EU's quality farm-to-fork policy. So I think that the, the first-class reputation that we have 
will severely be impacted on if, as a result of a TTIP negotiation, particularly as a result of a TTIP negotiation which is done um, in, in secret and not, it's not done in a transparent manner. Minister, you've been a formidable advocate and battler for the fishing industry, for the dairy industry. Uh, but what can you as Minister do in relation to TTIP, in relation to the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership? What can you do to oppose it as, as a Minister for a small part of the world? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an issue that's regularly discussed um, with um, myself and other Ministers in these islands. And I've recently met with uh, Martine Anderson, our, our own MEP, to discuss her concerns on the significant impact which I believe and she believes the TTIP would have if implemented. I have also recently um, raised the issue with DEFRA, so with the Agriculture Minister Liz Truss to set out my concerns in relation to TTIP and I have also taken up the issue with the Commissioner Phil Hogan um, to highlight the, specific, the, I suppose the specific concerns that we have in relation to the environment, in relation to workers' rights, in relation to consumer confidence and public services. So I think that whilst um, it is unlikely that a TTIP deal is going to be concluded any time in the near future, we think we need to continue to monitor developments and we need to exert our influence from a early, very early stage and to make sure that we use all avenues that are open to us to be able to lobby on our behalf. Mr. Roy Beggs for a topic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, beef, beef prices being offered locally to farmers is considerably less than that being offered in Scotland, literally a, a few miles away across the, the RIC. Uh, would the Minister advise what action is she and her department taking? to try and uh, assist in reducing that disparity and to improve uh, the income of local farmers? I think that um, it is very hard sometimes to compare the prices that our farmers receive compared to if it's Scotland or even the South, and, and that can be for a whole combination of reasons. It could be exchange, factors, it could, exchange rate factors, it could be supply and demand issues. So I think that the most important thing, and a lot of those things are outside of my control in that they are commercial matters. So for my Part, I believe that my role is to, to deliver where I can deliver, so that's around making sure we get single farm payments out as quickly as possible. It's around looking towards new market opportunities, which we've been very successful in doing over the last number of years, and we're continuing to do that because part of our strategy for the industry to be sustainable and to grow into the future is around looking towards new market um, opportunities. I think whenever we take the issue of price volatility, and that's always going to be a factor. The most significant thing this executive can do to help the industry is to create more opportunities, to open up more markets so it creates more opportunities, which guards against volatility. So I think that work alongside working with um, farmers around their own individual efficiency. So we have a farm business improvement scheme coming online, which will obviously help us to be able to support farmers to become more efficient on farm and therefore reducing their costs and therefore hopefully adding to their profit. So I think combination of issues and combination of reasons and, and ways that we can help the industry, not just the beef sector, but all the other sectors who are all struggling. Mr. Beggs for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. One of the issues that I have heard referred to has been, has been the, the issue of uh, discontinuity of supply. Uh, so, is the minister and her department uh, talking with the farming industry, talking with food processors, so that there is this better supply chain to enable them to reach? The UK prices, which generally UK mainland prices, which have generally been the highest of this region, so that we don't just look south, but we look to where there is the highest return for local farmers. I think I've um, just addressed what the, the issues that you're raising. It's around looking for new markets. It's around helping people to be more efficient. It's around um, furnace and supply chain, which is one of the issues which you, you touched on. I have been the champion of making sure there is furnace and supply chain. I have been the one that have consistently said that if we are going to, I, I, I suppose the cornerstone of the going for growth strategy around helping the industry is that there is recognition that there is only one supply chain and to that end I have established a supply chain forum which is about challenging the relationships, it is about forward thinking, forward planning, it is about communication from the farmer to the processor to the retailer to the, the, the big chain. So I think that without that, that proper conversation, without that um, ongoing and proper forward planning with farmers, then we're always going to find ourselves in a very challenging situation. So alongside opening up new markets, alongside helping farmers to be efficient, alongside providing advice, alongside business development groups, alongside all the other investment which we're doing in rural communities, I think it's important that we continue to challenge that relationship and we, make the supply, we work with the industry. Because initially, it obviously it is an industry um, issue that we work with the industry around making that supply chain the most effective, and that all elements of that supply chain get to enjoy the risk and the benefits. Uh, Mr. Chris Little, for a very, very short.
topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister if she'd be willing to meet with me in relation to the potential transfer of Karen Wood to DARD Forest Service? Question, can you make that equally short? Yes. <laughs> Members, before we move on to the next item of business, you will want to take your ease while we change the top deal.